Uh, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. We're going to get started here. It's um, the 15th of February, um, 2012. And um, Marianne started a conversation um, and with Troy Hicks and um, folks. And sorry, Mary. I'm uh, Marianne Riley. Um, and focus on the video and a uh, question about who drops out and why did they drop out and what can we do about thinking about high school participation. What, what? And Lewis is one of my students who's all has has considered himself a dropout and has come back again and he's on the phone and we have a group of other teachers here to talk about this and so we'll introduce them quickly. Um, and we don't know how the sound will happen here, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> Thank you all for dealing with this chaos. Marianne, could you maybe tell us how this conversation came about? And I do have the video queued up. I don't know if we want to see a part of it. Um, I have figured out how to play it and how in both places, so we can play with that a little bit here. But why don't you... Kick yeah, us off I a little bit. Introduce yourself in case people don't know you. Sorry. Uh, I know, but uh, I didn't actually start. Yeah, it. I, I, can, I, can you hear me okay? Or? I can. Mm -hmm. I, I, Lewis, wait one second. Lewis. Hello? I think you're going to either hang up or mute Lewis. Can I mute him? Or Hello? Okay. Hi, Lewis. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you participate? Yes. Okay, great. So listen in. We're getting started. Okay. Thank you for joining us, Lewis. Marianne, no go No problem. Ahead. Okay, so what I was um, saying was I didn't actually start the conversation. I just responded to a tweet um, where the conversation was already happening. So mm -hmm. I don't really know how the conversation started because I just came in at a point. I, I don't know if there's anyone here. <laughs> See, I knew somebody else would know Good. how. So how did it start? Because I know Teresa, I just responded. Teresa So I, Teresa probably knows. Yeah. Teresa, introduce can you yourself. Hear me? We can hear you fine. <laughs> Please introduce okay, yourself. Great. You're new to our show, so go ahead. Um, my name is Teresa Bunner, and um, currently I am an academic, academic specialist. Um, with the Blue Ribbon Mentor Advocate Program in the Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. Cool. Um, before that, for 20 years, I've been a classroom teacher at elementary, middle, and high school levels. And actually, the conversation started um, during the President's State of the Union address wow. when he brought up the issue of um, he thought all states should have this 18-year-old uh, mandate that, that, that students couldn't drop out before then. And so um, there were tweets started about um, how can you do that and where will the money come from? And I kind of played devil's advocate and said, wait a second, aren't we supposed to be prepared to keep them <laughs> until they're ready to graduate at 17 or 18 years old? Isn't that our job? Shouldn't the money already be there? And so it kind of started this back and forth conversation with a couple folks. Um, where people were saying, yeah, but why should they stay in high school? And I said, well, I think that's a different question than us saying we shouldn't be prepared for them to stay in high school. And so I think that's when you jumped in, Marianne and Troy, and we started some conversations, conversations back and forth and decided that um, it was a hard topic to do in 140 characters. <laughs> mm -hmm, that's for sure. And that's why I then sent the link for the video that you referred to as just um, sort of an example of when teachers are empowered to begin to think about what excellence might look like, that was a project that four teachers came up with um, and that students, you know, positively res um, responded to that year and it continues into this year as well. Just that there can be excellence so that it's not coercive, right? It's not about you must stay in mm -hmm. high school. We, we could shoot for you want to be um, learning and this is one avenue in which to learn. 
Uh, and by the way, I, I mean, this won't be a surprise to anybody on the show. I don't think it's the only avenue um, for learning. But I do think it's an important one, and, and it can be really um, an excellent choice. So long as people have agency freedoms to, to express themselves, both as learners as well as teachers as learners. I mean, I think the teachers, and you know, as, as, if you've seen the video, the teachers, um, I think it mattered in some ways maybe more for the teachers, oddly enough, than for the students. Um, the high school was, um, faculty was experiencing sort of low morale at that point. And, um, you know, my decision to um, sort of set, not to set up an academy, I had, I had nothing to do with that, but to um, privilege what did teachers want to do, what did they think was important, um, in some ways became a bit of a mirror for how teachers were working with students as well. So that whole respect, I think, matters, and really listening to see what do people value. Um, and then, um, you know, my very small role in that was simply to get it through a board of education um, and fund it. And, and, and Mar Mar Mariana, I'll, I'll just quote something you said in the video that it's all about doing something, I'll misquote you, um, doing something <laughs> that you love to do, something that you get up every day and you want to do and, yeah. you know, you're not kind mm -hmm. of forced to do it. And, and as you said, that kind of goes for teachers and for students. And so I mm -hmm. think we're trying to think about who drops out, why. Um, Troy, maybe you could speak next and talk a little bit about, Troy Hicks, introduce yourself. Um, your notion of, you know, has anything changed because of the last 10 years? Um, and so forth. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm Troy Hicks. I'm an associate professor and the director of the Chippewa River Writing Project at Central Michigan University. So I've been a long time um, uh, colleague of Paul and others in the National Writing Project. And um, part of my interest with this is really um, from the standpoint of teacher education reform and educational history. And um, I just got done finally reading Diane Ravitch's book about the death and life of the great American school system and um, as someone who studied teacher education and participated in professional development for a long time I know that um, um, I'm a little bit out of touch with the high school classroom and so really my question kind of stems from um, what's happened you know we're a decade in a little more than a decade into the 21st century and we've been talking about all these digital literacies and learning and new opportunities for collaboration and engagement and we have some models of success that have, um, you know, really begun to shine through. Um, and yet at the same time, we also hear about, you know, more testing, more, you know, narrowing of the curriculum. We see movies like Waiting for Superman and the Lottery. So, so I'm coming at this from a slightly different perspective than someone in the high school classroom right now. Um, and yet at the same time, I'm, I'm genuinely curious as a parent and as a teacher educator, um, what's happening how can we help? Um, what do we need to know? Um, do we really understand more about students and their motivation and their reasons why they're dropping out than what we did five or even 10 years ago? Hmm. And I want to jump a lot of other voices in here, but I don't want to lose Lewis. Are you there, Lewis? Yeah, no, I'm listening. Good. Okay. Introduce yourself a little bit and tell us, you know, your story a bit, and I think that'll give us some context for this conversation. Okay, my name is Lewis. I'm from the Bronx. Uh, I had dropped out of, uh, about a couple of months ago because really I was overwhelmed with, with uh, backed up work. And I just didn't I didn't feel like the new classes that I had to attend and on top of the fact of the makeup work, I just felt like there was nowhere I was going to, you know, you know, excel. Mm -hmm. And th that was one of the small reasons that, that made me, you know, not want to come back to school. I started just, you know, getting lazy and, 
and not wanting to be there because of all the backed up work. And then as a student of, you know, my nature and how I just kind of uh, procrastinate, um, the more backup, you know, makeup work that I have to be assigned to in projects, you know, I see like, you know, it's all this, you know, weight on top of me. Mm-hmm. And, and it's all on my own. I have no, you know, help. And, and you know, it's just a lot of work to deal with. And I just, you know, I break down and I, and I crash and I become, you know, just by myself. And I don't want to deal with it. So I just ended up stopped going to school and figured out that I would probably get the GED later on. And, you know, that's really, you know, where I was at. Lewis, can you tell a little more about your life as a musician? What kind of music do you oh, do? Oh, well, I'm a musician. Hmm. Okay, um, I, I play uh, I play about four different instruments. I, was, I grew up um, playing piano since I was four years old. Um, watching my father um, and my grandfather, and we came from a family, a musical family. I uh, I love music since I was a kid. I used to wake up early in the mornings and practice my piano. Um, I've been uh, associated with uh, different bands here and there as I got older and learned more. And I've been, I I've really got a school. I went to school for it and during the summer, and I also learned from my father, which was a musical teacher for kids, and I learned a lot about um, different things, and, you know, I started gaining, you know, more of an interest and even started um, giving lessons. So I play a, a lot of, I love rock, I love rock, I love classical music, you know. So I try to incorporate both into each other. So that's more or less what I like to do. Um, I realize music wouldn't put food in the table. So that was, that would really like, you know, I was thinking about career choice, you know, instead. I need, so I needed, I thought about that GED and stuff. And then I want to ask one more question. If you could tell us a little more about your schooling, maybe from middle school up, when did it start getting difficult for you? Yeah, I don't know if that's okay. the right way to ask okay. it, but yeah. All right. Well, honestly, uh, since I was a kid, honestly, since I was uh, a kid, I've always been um, like I said, I, I I was a procrastinator, so I've always like was barely making it, and I would always I would I never got left back. That's one thing I never got left back. Um, it started uh, when I hit my junior high, my junior high school. Um, I attended uh, Roberto Clemente High School. 166, and I was in there, and it, and I had a, in fifth grade, I remember that it started being a little bit, you know, I, I didn't like homework at all, and the homework was horrible, I, I hated homework, I never did homework, I, I used to hate doing homework, and if I, you know, completed it, then it was a miracle, I was happy, you know, but I just didn't like it, and plus, you know, I didn't have any family to help out with no, no homework and, and projects. I hated projects. I hated writing essays and, and do essays and all that stuff. So were it started you, there. And were then, you able to do music yeah. in school at all? No, I was not able to do music yet until I, I transferred out of that school and I went to another school, which allowed me to be a part of it. Um, I... And and then when I hit um my my last year of um, junior high, I was I joined a little mini uh, Latin band, little school band here, and really it was just um you know overall really fun for me and I and I would you know want to be there and complete all the classes and stuff you know with the um 
with with uh, the the school band and whatnot. And then um, my freshman year um, in high school, that's when I joined the jazz band in my high school. I love jazz, and that's when I really started, you know, wanting to be in school. I was excited, and then of course I started, you know. Once I realized that, uh, kind of like, it, it's just the the homework and all that stuff that I wasn't really focused academically. I was more into the, you know, the music and stuff, and I was all by myself basically. And then it just escalated from there. More laziness in high school. It showed me realness. Like compared to middle school and high school is completely different. Like you basically the credit system is you know serious, and you can it's very you have to be careful, and the way my attitude was since middle school, it, it screwed me up a little bit, and that's when I, you know, ended up, you know, slacking more and more. Last short question, and then please jump in anytime you'd like to. We'll be on here for another 45 minutes or so. Um, oh, okay. But okay. Um, <laughs> how, how old are you now, and you're trying to make a return now? And just briefly, why do you want to do that? All right. I was, I'm 18. Now, this is what happened to me, basically. Um, the, the reason why I wanted to return was after, we, as soon as I dropped out, I was happy. You know, I was like, you know what, no homework, no projects, no overdue work. I'm good. I'm living that, you know, free, no, no worried about me failing. At least I dropped out. If I dropped out, that's it, wrong. I dropped out, and, you know, my parents know that I dropped out. You know, it's, 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 um, it's something that, you know, I didn't have to worry about because now I'm out. Like, it's out. Like, I'm, I'm out. It was a relief. Mm -hmm. So, so now, as I'm either relaxed in the house, not going to school, you know, enjoying hanging out with friends and, you know, you know, participating in a lot of fun things, you know, like going out and, and looking at different bands and with music and getting very involved in different things, but keeping myself busy, you know, since I, you know, I lost track of the future. And then I started realizing that, you know, what am I going to do to have an education, to start a career in music? You know, what I need that, you know, to, even if I wanted to do musical engin engineering, how am I going to survive? And I started thinking that more and more. So I thought about the GED. Now, when I thought about the GED, I was up for it. But then I was reminded by a friend, why would you take the GED when you work so hard? You work so hard for all those credits. You're almost there. Why would you get that GED? And that really popped the question in my head, like, I can probably get it done. I can return to school. And then I started getting bored of hanging out. I started getting bored of doing nothing. And I just didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to live the life that I was living. I was basically tired of not, like, I was doing nothing. I, I just had all the fun, you know, juiced out of me. It was, you know, like a sponge effect. It just, I took the, I soaked up myself completely until I just, you know, squeezed it all out and I was, you know, done. Then I said, I got to do something. So I missed school. I started missing school. I started understanding, you know, when that person told me that, you know, you work for all those credits. So now that I returned to school, you know, I'm, I'm with a different attitude. Before, it was a procrastination attitude. And I'm like, you know what, I'll get it done the next week. Next week, I'll do better. After that, I'll, I'll do better. How about, you know what, I did bad today. I'm going to wait till next week to start again. No, now it's like I can probably get the high school out of the way successfully in, in six months or up to June. But if I break my back, I'd rather break my back for six months after taking this long vacation and get that diploma and be a success, then just, you know, instead of just being lazy and waiting, you know, another year, you know, now I woke up and I'm like, you know, 
So, I just needed support from teachers and family because I was never in communication with teachers. I'm the type of person that I wouldn't ask teachers questions when I get lost because I felt like I'm so lost that why should I bother? That's going to be more problems. And plus, since I'm always backed up, you know, the teachers won't take me seriously anymore. And I didn't want to ask anybody. I was by myself. So pretty much now the attitude is different. I'm understanding that school is extremely important. And especially in the position that I am in, that I only have a few credits to go, I might as well just do what I got to do. And Lewis, I'm thankful for that person. Lewis, it, it takes a long time uh -huh. to tell the story. I, I appreciate your patience in telling us. And I want to say that we did invite uh, three or four other people, um, so you wouldn't be like the only representative here. But um, thank you, f and please jump in whenever you hear something or you want to ask a question. This, can somebody else jump in? Maybe, maybe Buffy, introduce yourself and tell us what you've been thinking on this topic, and we can keep going here. Anybody want to talk back to Lewis? Feel free, yeah. also. No, no problem. Well, um, hi. Good. <laughs> thanks. And Lewis, thank you for sharing your story. Um, it actually really resonates with me. Um, I'm Buffy Hamilton, and I'm currently a school librarian. But I've also been a high school English teacher, and I taught in our school district's alternative school as well as our district's night school program. So I think, you know, in, in those kind of learning spaces and, and in my work as a school librarian, um, I, I, I feel like I've seen a really interesting and diverse cross-section of, of the school experience. And, and Lewis's story really resonated with me um, in thinking that, you know, in alternative school and night school, and even the kid that, you know, I encounter now, um, you know, in our learning space in the library, you know, there are so many students that, you know, we, we force them to conform to this very rigid model. Um, and Again, this is nothing new to any of you, but you know this almost factory type environment. You know these massive, super-sized schools with you know eighteen hundred to thirty-six hundred students, and um, yeah, you know, it's frustrating you know to me um, as a, as an educator to see you know what um, I think the standardized testing movement you know is doing to to our young people, and to think about how you know, so many voices are being silenced and, and, and opportunities for access to learning in a lot of different ways and, and, and honoring that, um, unfortunately, is being you know, cut off and denied. So, um, you know, certainly, you know, the issue of you know, trying to reach all learners is one that really you know, speaks to, to my heart as a former classroom teacher and now as a teacher in the library. Um, because so much of my work that I do with teachers really is, you know, the collaboration and dealing with instructional design and, you know, how do we differentiate, you know, um, with different types of literacies, um, you know, whether it's traditional information, digital, new media, what have you, um, to provide our students, you know, ways of accessing and evaluating information and then, you know, creating learning products and expressing themselves and engaging in inquiry. Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself? Me? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what I'm doing here. I'm Jeff Grinvoltz yeah. from Nebraska. Oh, I just uh, <laughs> always saw these uh, cool things on Google Docs, Google Plus, and I just wanted to see what it was like and drop out and the whole lack of engagement in high school except I'm very interested so I was just very interested to hear uh, all of you talk about it so Jeff are you a watch. teacher or uh, what's your interest oh yeah I teach I, I teach okay. high school at Westside in Omaha okay and what's your interest in, in dropout and in, in high school engagement or what do you, what's your take on it I have two takes. I was just uh, chatting over in the other place there about, I have two kids. One's 18 and one's 13. And my 18-year-old is that classic disengaged high school student that kind of forced him to, to get through school. So I've seen a lot of these, I guess, problems from a parent point of view rather than teacher point of view. And, it, and I'm just concerned about 
if we failed him, or if I failed him, or the school system failed him, um, he'll graduate. But it's been a it's just been a harrowing experience. And then my daughter is this free thinker, really smart girl, and I just feel like she complains about school constantly and and hates certain subjects and her teachers. And I just feel like, what can I do to fix this? What can I do to make it better? So there's that that standpoint. And then as a teacher, of course, I see these kids in my classes and wondering, you know, why are they learning about Shakespeare? Why are they taking algebra? Why are they doing this and that when they hate it? They're not enjoying it. They're not good at it. It's making them feel stupid and lonely and depressed and hating education. And so I just, just wonder what everybody's got to say about a new educational system. So maybe start a new school if, if you're interested. Others, Monica, Chris, jump in, guys. Scott. Well, um, I think Monica can probably talk about starting a new school since she has. Um, but before um, maybe she does that, I, it was interesting. I had a talk with a student today who's a senior, and he had me um, read his um, scholarship application to our university uh, in town here in Utah, University of Utah, and it was due today. You know, and he was applying for this scholarship uh, that was pretty important. Um, and so he said, you got to read this over. I've got to get it in today. And um, so he's the first, he would be the first person in his family, mom or dad's side, to go to college, right? And like the second to graduate from high school. And he started talking about um, how he had to separate himself from this group of friends that have all dropped out by now. And, and I started thinking about his progress and how he's taken it upon himself to come to me um, and ask really some things that I thought people knew, like, you know, how to research and, and how to find information and stuff like that. And I think of Mary Ann's school, and it, it strikes me that if we're able to work in small groups with students, then, you know, really amazing things happen. But then I think about what Buffy was talking about. You know, if, if we lose people in these really large classrooms, it's not as likely to happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm someone who struggles with the dropout not very often, but today was a place where, um, you know, a student kind of chronicled how he turned it around himself. Basically, it was because he started to uh, realize that his mom works really hard just to get him where he is right now. Um, more to that story, but um, that's how I've, my encounter with uh, dropout kind of conversation just this afternoon. And he did get his letter done, by the way. Great. Well, I would add, um, you know, there's the 4.0 dropout as well. You know, it's, it's more a matter of, um, yeah, maybe their physical body is there. Um, uh, just attended another um, teen funeral last week. And so it's a, it's a pretty big, I guess, I guess what I'm thinking is the conversation needs to change as to um, are we defining success by a college diploma and what are the options? You know, um, it, we're not saying school is bad, but I'm, I'm calling into question who's together in a space needs to be per choice so that that engagement can happen. So, you know, all the things you guys are talking about, um, it can happen anywhere, and we can follow it everywhere. And if we um, are privy to the options that we have today, and we create spaces of permission for those, you know, to proceed in such a way. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking as I'm listening, um, Monica, to what you just said, and thinking about what Lewis said, um, and also reflecting, I just left a conversation with my 13-year-old in which um, he absolutely hates school and has little to no interest in being in school. Um, I don't remember, and I apologize, the gentleman who's above me uh, on this little list of like all our faces. Um, if you drag it across, from, you can see the Nebraska. name. Jeff? Jeff. Yeah, Grinvold, Jeff, right? thank you. Nebraska, yeah. Nebraska. <laughs> I think about what Jeff was saying um, about his own children. and. You know, I'm guessing that we're all, you know, reasonable people who seem to have personal or professional and or both examples of how schools, the way they tend to function, don't really 
tend to work well for a lot of kids. It's, you know, I, I also took a look at the Gates report that um, I think, Paul, you might have posted or, or someone had posted, and looking at those enormous numbers of youngsters who opt <coughs> to drop out for, you know, a variety of reasons. It just strikes me that this really is epidemic. And, um, you know, I, it, it would seem that we need to have a better response than, um, you know, hoping that like someone like Monica um, creates um, a learning space. I mean, it just strikes me that funding for people to create learning spaces is a whole lot more important than funding for Pearson funding or funding for McGraw-Hill or, or any of the billions of dollars that will go out the door for testing. I mean, it just, do you know what I mean? Like it just strikes me as it's criminal uh, especially when we start to look at um, that the children die in this. You know, it, this, this should be a national um, interest um, and not just to, you know, whether you use technology or don't use technology or, I mean, all of those things to me are so secondary to healthy environments and a broad sense of what it means to be successful. Uh, we have such a net, that whole, you know, I don't know how all of you feel, but that whole college and career readiness thing it's just such a phrase that is empty to me. You know, I'm not sure even what we even mean by it nationally, other than that you, the only way you know is if you take a test. And I just know that that makes little sense to so many young people and, you know, as a parent, as, as a parent. Anyway, let me, I can hear myself rambling. Let me stop. But that's <laughs> what's on my mind. And Lewis, by the way, let me just say thank you. Um, privileged to listen to you, and I'll be in the Bronx tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, no problem. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it, it, I honestly, you know, I spoke to Paul and, um, you know, I really just wanted to share the story because, because honestly, you know, being a dropout, you know, I thought it was the end of the world, but, you know, honestly, just getting back to school, you know, you know how important it is when you leave you understand and to get a second chance to come back to school after you know already being in you know an alternative school you know that you know woke me up and I said wow you know you don't get chances like that and to be honest you know I, I would like to you know it would be nice if we can spread the word to the rest of the students who you know feel like there's no more hope um, I wanted to touch on, um, Buffy mentioned the fact that our schools are this so is large. Teresa. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, this is Teresa, sorry. Okay. And Lewis talked about, um, I needed support from teachers and family. And I think mm -hmm. that um, the, the role that I serve now, I work predominantly with African American, Latino, and Burmese refugee students. Um, the two years before this, I taught in an alternative school, and the four years before that, I opened, I helped start and open a brand new traditional high school that served a district where over 80 languages were spoken, and almost 50% of our student population um, got free and reduced lunch. So I've worked with, for the last number of years, with the, the unmotivated, the kids who could be disenfranchised and drop out. And the thing that I hear over and over and over from kids is that need for relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think when we talk about these large schools, we lose that. And I think when we talk about engagement, part of what engage, part of where engagement comes from is um, why do you study Shakespeare so that you know where lines like know thy audience come from? When I'm in front of that classroom, I have to know my audience. Is that me? And no. I'm not, I can't teach Romeo and Juliet the same way every period, every year, because I have to know the kids who are sitting in that room, and that's part of the engagement. And I think we've lost that. And I'm going to say, 
I've worked elementary, I've worked middle school, and I've worked high school. When I worked elementary as a reading specialist, I can't think of a single kindergarten or first grade classroom that I walked into where not every hand would shoot up when I asked a question. Somewhere we're killing that desire to learn. And Lewis mentioned about fifth grade. And when I talk to my high schoolers, that upper elementary middle school is where somehow we're killing we become, it becomes about college career ready, Marianne, and not about learning anymore and inquiry. And so I think that's one of the things that we have to look at that I feel strongly about. And right now, part of my job is to go around during the day and observe kids in classrooms. And I gotta tell you, there are days when I can't wait to get out of some of those classrooms. And I'm really glad I'm the adult who can get up and leave whenever I want. Cool. Not all of them, but there are some where I'm just like, I don't think I can sit here any longer because there really is no engagement going on. Yes. Well, so I want to. I guess the question then is how, how do we build that in? How do we expect that? Is it. I think there's a difference too when you talk to an elementary school staff versus a middle school staff versus a high school staff. Somehow it becomes less and less about kids, in my, at least in my experience. That's an overgeneralization because I need to say I've worked with some absolutely fantastic, wonderful um, high school teachers. I'm the mom of four boys. My oldest is a sophomore in high school. He loves some classes. I'm dragging him by his hair through some other classes. I've got two middle schoolers one is trying to get into an academy next year for high school that's going to require us driving. You know, it's going to put a big strain on our family, but that's what he wants because he feels like he's not going to be engaged and challenged as he would like in, in the regular high school where his brother currently goes. So I think there, I don't think there's one simple answer, but I think relationship is a good place to start. Totally agree with the relationship. I would um, kind of add that I think if we um, focus on a process of learning, um, a self-reflection, a self-assessment versus a standardized assessment, you know what to do and you don't know what to do, um, then we don't need to have the massive amount of the rest of the curriculum and we have people in spaces for choice. Um, and then we can facilitate the curiosity within each kid. and people like Lewis can do music and we can call that school. Um, I think one of the myths is that learning is linear. And even though we say it's not linear, I don't think we can grasp what that means. What that means is there's no basics. There's no, nothing that you need to learn before you come to me, as long as you're, or not even come to me, that I would come to you. You know, if, if you're learning, if you're intrigued in something, you can jump right in wherever. Um, yeah, that's, that's completely true. Honestly, most students need some type of motivation. And when I was in that school, um, which the school I'm in right now, actually, um, I remember that when they, they didn't have a music program when I entered. But one thing that happened is that my principal listened, and he heard that, and he listened to me, and I told him I was a musician, and I, and I love music. And what what inspired me? What is it inspired him? And he he basically moved me because by the next week he already uh, called some type of program to start a musical program in the school, and I had a music class and I can take that elective for credit, and that had me like on a motivational roll. I was coming to school every day and doing what I had to do, and that you know I was just. That was my motivation, music. And a lot of the students, like you said, you know, need that, you know, some type of something that can, you know, draw them, you know, that could be like school is not only about books, 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 but hey, you know, there's something that you, you like to do, you know, that can also get you some type of credit, you know, stay, stay in school. So can I ask a question? Jump in. Please. Yeah. So where were your parents in this when you when you decided to drop out and everything? I might have missed that part of the conversation, but I was just I was thinking about parental involvement and family involvement and that kind of support system and whether or not you had it. 
Okay, well, honestly, I, I didn't have a, a family support system. Um, um, my mother and my father wake up together in the morning at 4 in the morning and leave the house by at least 5-something or, or 6 o'clock. They're already out of the house. Um, so I have no parents in the house. Um, my sister gets up. She's out the house by 7. She goes to school in Manhattan. And she needs to be in school by 8. So I was by myself when I woke up. And since I didn't like to get up early, I would always snooze the alarm until like 7, 7.30. When there's no one in the house, you know, you know you're supposed to go to school at first. So at first it's like, you know, all right, um, let me, you know, get to school. All right, all right, let's just keep going. Then as days pass by, you notice that you're by yourself, and then you take a day or two to not go to school because your parents wouldn't know. And that's what really started my absence. And I started becoming more absent and absent every day. And it was really just, it just became horrible, and I started never coming to school because my parents were not there in the morning. And I needed that support, you know, because I didn't have that. And my parents would, you know, I would always stay away from them because I didn't want to stress them out because I was always stressing them out with school stuff. And I said, you know, if they hear that I'm being absent, you know, it's going to stress them out. Let's just keep it quiet. And I would always avoid, you know, parent-teacher conference, and I would try to tell them, no, it's come happening a different day somehow. And then, you know, end up, I'll end up getting caught and go have a meeting and find out that I'm doing bad. My family always wants to support me, but they work. So, really, in reality, I'm always by myself, and I needed that. What changed that for me right now is I decided to go and move in with my grandmother, and every morning since I got back to school, she wakes me up, uh, and I and I just started breaking the habit of not, you know, waking up late. And she, you know, keeps me awake. Having someone there really helps to put you, back, you know, to get into school early and to make it. And now it's a different story, you know. Thanks. No problem. Other thoughts, Troy? What have you been thinking over there? Perhaps. Oh, I've been thinking a lot, Paul. <laughs> I've been. <laughs> throwing in some links and some questions in here about mm -hmm. motivation and the purposes of schooling. And uh, I mean, I certainly agree with all the, the comments in here about, you know, sadly, the arts are the first to go and schools are so mm -hmm. test driven and so forth. But, um, you know, it, I, I keep coming back to this idea that, you know, we are in this moment right now where there are so many things happening to schools. Budgets are decreasing unions are being busted around the country common core standards and assessments are coming into play caps on charter schools are being lifted we have um, movies like the lottery and waiting for superman that have brought these things to public attention um, if we don't do something as teachers and teacher educators clearly there are many many other people who are willing and able to do it for us and so I think we need to really rethink our paradigm about what it means, you know, for teachers and tenure and reform, all those things that Arnie Duncan <laughs> mentioned today, but, you know, in, in hopefully a slightly different, more positive way for us to think about it. But specifically about the dropout problem, um, I'm just wondering, like, when and how might we be able to adapt and use, um, you know, these technologies to reach out and connect and collaborate and obviously the things that you have done, you know, so well with youth voices and things like that. But, you know, just thinking about Lewis's story, like there's really no reason that he should have felt that way in school. And yet he did. And clearly hundreds, probably thousands of other kids feel that way right now. And I don't know what the dropout rate is every day anymore and all those other things, but there's something wrong. Like there's, it, it's, it's just inexcusable. We, we have to, do something so i've tried to put in some links to some resources and some thinkers and um i'll mention specifically um iris sokol is a, a an educational theorist and blogger and 
he um, really helps me think about the paradigms and the ways that we look at education. And so I'll throw a link to his blog in here again and would encourage you to check that out. And I would add too, um, kids are telling me 75% of them are in that boat of it, it's not a fitting place for them. And that's probably even low, you know, they were probably even being generous with it through the course of the day. And what's more precious than the human spirit and the days that we have? So why are we, if we don't believe in it, why are we just, you know, saying, okay, GED is success, is success, we've got to get to school. Why aren't we going, why is it so hard? Why is it, why is it not fitting so many people and questioning that? And I would second the whole Ira thing. He had a tweet session going last night about um, bullying. And, you know, if you, if you want to be exposed to bullying, go to school. Um, I really believe that adolescence to midlife crisis is because we're forcing this publicly prescribed curriculum in spaces where people aren't choosing to be in. And nothing against learning. I mean, nothing against all the great teachers out there. I just think we're in the wrong spaces. And if I can expand on that a little bit, it's not just Scott a high Go school ahead. problem. Yeah. No, no. And, you know, and I'm a, a prime example. I'm not proud of it, but it took me four times to get my college degree. I'm in my mid-40s, and I just finally finished. And I started right out of high school and majored in billiards. I did very well, but the college asked me to go home. Two other occasions, I started different programs, but it just, I mean, I could do the work, but it just didn't fit. It was like wearing somebody's, somebody else's clothes, and I finally found my passion and was able to go through it. It was an alternate, alternative program. It still, I mean, it, it didn't fit my learning style, but I muddled through it because I was passionate about the topic. But it's, you know, it's it's not just a high school thing. It goes on forever and ever. I mean, luckily I found my way out of the darkness and had the means to do it, but I think I'm part of the minority. I just don't know how to fix it. Well, I will put a plug in here then because I do feel a responsibility. Um, uh, we are initiating a collaboratory, a national and global research place, so that um, I feel like I've gotten really close to, because the district's given me the space of permission to listen to kids without an agenda, and gotten really close um, to some ways that can work. And so we do want to help anybody who wants to start it anywhere and follow it everywhere. Um, looking into some apps that can help create those spaces, um, crowdsource your community, and create those spaces of permission. Hmm. So just a little plug in there. Uh, I had a question for Marianne, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, because okay. your video is from two, well, maybe last summer, I don't know. I it's from last remember. year. That's yeah, yeah, but I'm wondering, you know, how has that continued this year? You know, what's the status of the academy and everything, and the, and the rest of the school, because it seems like that was kind of a laboratory and you were then going to bring that out to the rest of the school or something? Well, no. Um, it's It was one of a handful of innovations that started. Um, so it wasn't the only um, innovation. I can tell you just enrollment-wise, um, the first year inside more innovative types of spaces like what you saw with the academy, there were probably about 70 students involved. Um, this is a 1,500 student population. Um, last year, after one year of the innovative spaces, the requests by students um, came about more than 500 students wanted to participate in that range of different kind of innovations. Um, so, I mean, it went from, you know, from 50 or 60 kids to 500. So it, kids certainly picked up on the idea that there were other ways of learning than th none of these were traditional, um, you know, kind of courses. They were interdisciplinary courses or um, transdisciplinary courses. So um, there was that. But I, I want to say what I think was at the heart of all of this um, innovation was not um, the name of the course or the type of course it was that students had permission and teachers had permission to think. I know that sounds so stupid, but 
I mean, so much of what I see, um, I, I'm working as a consultant now for a variety of public schools in New York City, and so much of what I see is that people have stopped thinking, and they just do stuff. There's like a whole lot of stuff that has to get done um, in, in 10 minutes, and it's like this overwhelming sense, um, especially what I see public school teachers in, in New York City dealing with, with the craziness of all this um, test prepping. And I think that over time, that has become more the norm. And I'm, I'm not just saying it about test prepping, but it becomes like a behavior. What I think was attractive to both teachers and kids is that it was a space for them to think, not to have answers, but to think, and, um, and to do so collectively. Um, I think that's what drew people in, and, I, and it continues today. Um, it, all of those um, projects are running. Um, they're all fully um, you know, staffed with both kids and, and with um, teachers. So um, it, you know, I, I don't see it stopping. Um, at this point at all. Lots of head shaking and so forth. Uh, anybody jump in? Yeah. Well, I was just going to jump in, Marianne. It's Teresa. You said um, it, it's silly that you gave permission to think, but I think that is so vital, and I think that's where the engagement is dropping off. We're not inviting kids to think in the classroom, nor are we inviting teachers to think about what's going on in their yeah. classroom. We've become, with the standards movement, with the standardized test movement, it's become, here's the curriculum, check this off, teach this, and move on. Um, a couple years ago, I did a um, unit with the seniors that I had on closing the achievement gap. I brought them all the information. We looked at op-ed pieces. We looked at state data, local data, national data on um, dropouts, on standardized tests. And I said to them, you've been the consumers for 12 years. What is the solution to the problem? Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of different discussions. We never came up with one answer. But one, I can remember having this debate back and forth, this Socratic type seminar. And one young lady looked and said, this is part of the problem. Why don't we have conversations like this in all of our classes? Mm -hmm. They give us worksheets. They want us just to sit down and shut up and do what we're told to do. Why can't we talk like this in all of our classes? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a powerful point that you make, Marianne, when you say that permission to think. I think not only permission, but I think I'm, you know, and. I want to be careful what I say here, but I think we need to challenge each other within the profession to think. I, I think mm -hmm. I think we need to stop being okay with status quo. Um, you know, when I was a department chair, you know, there was this fine line, but you know, at some point I had to push my department and I had to say, well, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Where are we getting with this? You know why do we why do we think we have to go this direction versus this direction, and and asking those questions instead of just blindly doing something mm -hmm. because we've been told we need to be saying why are we doing this? Does this match the need of the students that I'm serving? And if not, what are the alternatives to that? Yeah, you know, can I just ask the group, um, just picking up, um, Teresa, on what you were saying, one of the things I'm wondering about, um, if there's a lot of dialogue where you are um, about sort of this, this overwhelming idea of curriculum that uh, for some reason we, we seem to be uh, believing that all of these subjects, you know, especially by the time you get to secondary or even now, I mean, I'm reading about midterms in middle school. I mean, it's just so nutty. But there's this lineup of, you know, eight courses that constitute or seven courses that constitute a, a, an 11-year-old or a 17-year-old's day. And, you know, I'm just finding that as an adult, I, and, I mean, I've been well-educated. I don't know most of these things at all anymore. Like, I would not pass our biology test in this state. I wouldn't pass our algebra test. Um, it doesn't mean that I can't reason well, but it does mean that uh, most of those things I've forgotten along the way. Um, I do know how to find out information if I need that, and I certainly know how to, I think, reason well. But 
that isn't what's on the top of the list. Like reasoning well and, you know, being compassionate, being kind, those things aren't, you know, even like, I don't think there's any standards about those things. It's more about very finite um, bits of content that, I mean, in your, just let me ask, like, like your daily lives, do you really need to know the things you learned in high school? I mean, do we ever talk about that? <laughs> I just um, finished Susan Cain's um, Quiet, uh, The Power of the Introvert in a World That Can't Stop Talking. And I think, you know, there's introvert in all of us. That the, One of the main things I got from her when she was talking about these spaces, a space where you don't have to prove yourself, and we live in a culture that it's all about the proof. It's all about the data. And, you know, how, how ironic in that that's exactly what we don't need, you know. <laughs> and so um, all those things that you mentioned, Marianne, they're all measurable. Um, even, even though mathematically speaking, we're measuring them inaccurately. And it, it really has no beans to it. Um, but they're supposedly measurable, so those are the things. But imagine spaces, and I would question, do they even have to be a classroom, but imagine spaces where people don't have to prove themselves. Um, and that's where we're going to see the difference between mediocre and breathtaking. Mm -hmm. And the kids in the academy that you saw, those youngsters had permission to do things that are not normally measured. You know, a sonata doesn't get measured by, you know, some bubble test. Um, the measure was the standing ovation, um, and, you know, as an external measure, and then the internal measure was, was what the youngster thinks about that work and, and how it makes her feel and, and the achievement she, she names of it. That's not what we're, we don't have those kinds of measures. We have kind of, you know, just very rudimentary, silly things that um, we put a lot of power into. And we really believe, can I just, we'll just say one last thing. In New York City, I just looked at their predictive tests, it, which is this odd thing where kids take a multiple choice assessment. There's some open-ended, but every school I'm in, they only do the multiple choice. And Troy, you, you don't even want to listen to this part. They measure writing um, proficiency based on three multiple choice questions. And one had to do with a semicolon at the same level. You know, I mean, what we know that that's just not really anything. And yet it becomes the measure. And when kids don't do well on it, it's like, a, oh my goodness, they can't read and write. Well, we don't, I mean, we're not even looking at the measure that says this is idiotic. This has nothing to do with how well you read or write. This is how well did you know to put the semicolon from a choice of four possible answers? You know, and I will tell you, the person I showed it to was a CEO of a very large company, and she said to me, I didn't know A was the correct answer. And I said, well, you know, not sure how you got to be a CEO then. You know, and that's what I guess I'm after. It's like, why are we continuing this, and how do we stop it? Good. And I also would say Ira's, um, anything by Ira is just wonderful to read. <laughs> Buffy, to do, do you have any, um, we, I'm going to ask you to begin a round of closing thoughts. Um, any thoughts you have here as you've been listening? Well, I think what strikes me this evening is, and, and from my own experience and listening to, to your experiences as well, is that, you know, this, this era of no child left behind, and this is my 20th year, and I kind of marked my career before no child left behind and after mm -hmm. no child left behind, mm -hmm. but that it really has created not only, you know, this culture in which students are encouraged to be passive, um, and I forgot who said this a few minutes ago, but the idea that, you know, asking students what they think, students wanting to engage in a conversation, you know, I've seen the same thing, is we've tried to, um, create participatory learning experiences for our students through the library, so many kids will, will say to me they're ninth and 10th grade, nobody's ever asked me what I thought. 
Um, or, you know, we do the fishbowl discussion and they may need a little encouragement and scaffolding initially, but once they get their feet under them, they love it because they have choice and ownership in those conversations for learning. But by the same token, while that is, it does become empowering for some, for kids and for teachers that, you know, this, this testing culture has become a successful medium that's very uncomfortable and you start getting pushback because suddenly you're encouraging a different way of learning that's more open and more fluid and less definitive perhaps um, and that can become very uncomfortable and so you know I'm really thinking a lot tonight about how teachers and students um, I think the fallout of this testing culture is that we become compliant and consequently you know, not reflective practitioners that are asking that essential question, you know, why are we doing this, you know, and that we've lost our courage to ask that really important question. Oh, let me identify. Uh, Teresa, final thoughts. Uh, Just if you have any. Well, I, I, <laughs> I don't know where to start. I, I guess. On my darkest day when I want to say, oh my God, we're never going to get it right, I want to stop and remember a conversation like this and know, I mean, I, I'm constantly amazed by the people I talk to on Twitter, I'm on the English Companion Ming, and you know, we joke about our dream faculty and our dream school, right. and I, I want to gather y'all together and, you know, have us all work in the same place. Yeah. Um, so I guess as as discouraged as I can get, I'm also encouraged that there are voices out there. Like Marianne, my question is, how do we stem the tide of what's happening? And I don't think there is an exact response, except I think we need to keep having these conversations. I think we need to keep challenging each other. Hold on just a second. Um, and um, we need to, um, we need to make sure that we don't stop having those conversations. Um, because I think when we stop having the conversations both with kids and with each other, then we really have um, lost what we are hoping for. I think that's all really wise. I, I, I want to jump and remember something that Deborah Fries from, um, I think I got the name, yes, from, from Walk Out, Walk On encouraged us to think about that as important as these meetings are every Wednesday, um, having local groups that meet face to face around these issues is, is really important also. So I'm sure you agree with that, but I wanted to mention it. Troy, let's turn to you for a second. Troy here. Turning to me? Did I hear that yeah, right? Yes. Oh, okay, I thought so. <laughs> I, I was like you've moved. I'm multitasking here. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I ran out of uh, battery on my laptop, so I had to go plug right, in. Okay. Um, you know, Scott and I are having this conversation right now about, you know, the constraints that happen within school. And, you know, I've always been one to be very sensitive to um, teachers and those constraints that you feel. And yet at mm -hmm. the same time, um, and he mentioned this then, says it does exist, but only covertly. And we could talk a little bit more about that. But what you know, what is it that we can do? Like, we know that good teaching will do certain things um, for kids in terms of their creativity and their engagement and their connection and all these important things that have to happen in order to have kids feel like they belong at school and actually want to be there. So um, at some point, and, and I know there's pressures, I'm not trying to discount them, but it, at some point, like, we have to stand up and say, like, we understand that this is good for kids. We understand that this is, yeah, I mean, and Buffy just put it, they feel subversive too, and we've had that since Neil Postman, right? But there's this idea that, you know, why? Like, if we know what works and we can do it, why don't we do it? And we have forums like this now, you know, like, um, my son is about to graduate from high school too, and he, he has taken to using Facebook as a forum, Google Plus as a forum, mm -hmm. blogging as a forum. 
he feels like he goes to school and plays the game, and then he comes home and he's able to actually have the conversations that he wants, learn the mm -hmm. things that he wants, get links to new ideas, try mm -hmm. things out, actually feel free to voice his opinion. Um, why can't he do that at school? What What is it that's preventing that from happening? And I know it's it's more than just what we do in our classrooms, but oh my gosh, I, I just feel like we we have too many smart people doing too many good things that feel they have to use words like covert and subversive and it's it's just not right we have an opportunity right now with all these reforms going on to really step up and um think about something different so i don't know what that different is totally um i have some ideas and i know you all do too and i hope we keep talking about it well thank you for joining us tonight lewis are you, you're still there yes i can't see you so i'm not sure if if anybody needs to leave, thank you. We get it, um, uh, Lewis. Any, what are you thinking after having listened to all these folks talk about this? Well, you know, now I hear um, how many people actually, you know, want to do something about, you know, helping out students, and mm -hmm. and one of the main things that really stood out in this conversation was relationship and communication and I truly think that those two things are key into you know knowing more of, about your students and understanding them and you know this is uh, sounds like you know there's a lot of people with uh, with the heart of you know trying to do something about it and um, you know it sounds like it's it's going to be successful if we can actually get something done you know and pretty much yeah good and Lewis tomorrow you'll tell me more about how you've been teaching music one of the things you said really quickly is that you actually have done some teaching so yeah, I want to learn more about that Okay. <laughs> Great. Anybody else want to jump in here at the end? Shall we call it a day <laughs> or an evening here? No, I think well, probably. I just want to say yeah, one go thing. Ahead. Please um, go ahead. There's this wonderful um, speech that Cornell West gave to English teachers in 1996 at an NCTE conference. And he closed the speech by um, inviting people to join him um, in what he called a grand tradition in terms of dialogue and conversation and activism. And um, the end of his speech, um, he says something to the effect that he was going to go down fighting. Um, he wasn't sure he was going to win, but he was certainly going down fighting. And it just strikes me that um, that's sort of the spirit I feel in tonight, that, um, you know, I, maybe I just feel it as a parent. Um, I certainly feel it when I listen to Lewis, um, that we have, you know, some, some responsibilities and obligations to go down fighting um, for what is right for, um, for, for, for learners and, 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 and for the profession. And it just strikes me that having listened to everybody tonight, um, the, route, the road we're on isn't productive for um, like, I, I don't know who it's productive for. You know, maybe there's somebody this has been working for, but, you know, we're not hearing about that. But for the majority, it doesn't even feel as if, you know, kids do graduate, they get through, and that's the language they use. Or yeah. um, what I was listening to what Troy just said about his, um, I don't know if it was a son, Troy, or, or daughter, um, but your child who's graduating, and that, um, I think it was a he, right, that waits to get home to do the thinking. I'm seeing that, I, and I do think that in the world we live in where kids can connect, my 13-year-old is connected around the world with other kids. Um, he has a business at this point um, uh, with a dedicated server. None of this is part of his school life, and I don't think he's so terribly unique that there aren't multiple kids like him all over the place. Um, I don't think these kids are going to sit down like like the kids did four or five years before them. I think the level of opportunity that they're going to find for themselves 
good, bad, or indifferent, will be far more um, enticing than what is offered at the local school. And it just strikes me that, you know, we have a fight in front of us that we could do great work, you know, for, um, for our country, for ourselves, or, or multiple countries, um, and, um, and for kids. And it just strikes me that we're going to have the, need the resolve to do that. So, um, Paul, thank you so much for these well, kinds of you. engagements because yeah. it's um, energizing to hear all the different voices around this. Um, well, I'm, I'm calling it a table because it feels like a table to me, um, but in this, in this large room. Thank so thank I, you. I, I know it's I, late, but I would just like to add a, a guru to me for boldness is Roger Martin, and he talks about that we live in a reliability-oriented world. And just the, knowing that, instead of accepting it when people say things so boldly that are truly false and we don't believe in them. Mm -hmm. um, it takes 15, supposedly 15 to 20 percent of a school of fish to turn it around or a flight of birds to turn it around. And so we have that, that many people. And if we start to focus on that, that there's that many people that want to change this and not succumb to the the boldness that the people with the reliability thinking and the data-driven thinking, you know. So we have all that we need now, and we just need to individually say, bunk. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's get on with what matters. Great. Um, and it's, I didn't, there's no exact plan, but there was a young man who checked in with us, um, and he has moved on from high school and is working and wasn't able to join us tonight. But it did seem to me like we might be able to continue some conversation around these topics again next week. So let's uh, say, at least think about that. I um, want to sign off here saying that we've been broadcasting over the EdTech Talk um, channel of the World Bridges Network. Um, that's at edtechtalk.com and worldbridges.net. And you can find links to all this other wonderful stuff um, at those at, at edtechtalk.com and other places. <laughs> Thank you all, and we'll Thanks, talk guys. to you again. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Thank Bye. you very Bye. much. Good night. Goodbye.